In this section of the video tutorial, we're going to walk you through how to set up a game of Syndicate. First, take out the game board and place it in the middle of your table. Place a clear cube on the round track in the one box. You'll use this cube to track round progression throughout the game. Next, place the alert track near the board. Place another clear cube on the alert track in the one box. This track represents how alert the Sovereign is to crime in its system. Whenever players fail a mission or try to assault other players, the Sovereign alert level increases. Higher alert levels result in more punitive actions taken by the Sovereign against all players. Bonus chips provide players rewards for setting up new criminal bases. These chips come in three colors corresponding to the three zones of Arcturus. Green for Exo, Orange for Middle, and Yellow for Inner. Sort the bonus chips into three piles by color, reward side down, and shuffle each pile separately. Place one face down green Exo bonus chip in each of the six corresponding Exo placeholders. Then place one face down orange middle bonus chip in each of the nine corresponding middle hex placeholders. And finally, place one face down yellow inner bonus chip in each of the three corresponding inner placeholders. Place the leftover bonus chips back in the box. Now we're gonna set up the Sovereign card deck. Take the Sovereign cards out of the box and look for the beginning of the end card. Set the beginning of the end card aside and shuffle the remaining Sovereign cards face down. Draw two Sovereign cards and shuffle together with the face down beginning of the end card. Draw four more Sovereign cards and place on top of the first three cards. Finally, draw one more Sovereign card and place at the bottom of the new deck. Put the leftover Sovereign cards back in the box. Place the Sovereign card deck in the corresponding placeholder on the board. The Sovereign deck should now have eight cards in it with the beginning of the end card somewhere in the fifth, sixth, or seventh position. Remove the operation cards from the box and shuffle together. Deal out four cards for each player and leave aside. Place the remaining operation card deck into the corresponding placeholder on the board. Also place the advanced tech card deck and the base card deck in their corresponding placeholders on the board. Remove from the box and set aside the other game pieces you'll be using shortly, including the three six-sided consequence dice, the 12-sided sovereign die, and the 18 base tiles. Put the currency cubes in reach of all players. Place the Sovereign Destroyer on the alert track and put the Assault Ship near the board. Finally, get the Player 1 marker ready. Now that the board is ready to go, let's set up the player's Syndicate mats. First, shuffle the Syndicate card deck and deal each player two Syndicates. Players will pick one of the two Syndicates to play as. Once players have made their selection, they should find the corresponding player mat. Give each player a set of colored player marker cubes, a cheat sheet, and the four operation cards set aside earlier. The front of the mat is a player's dashboard throughout the game, keeping track of resources and abilities. There are three boxes for resources corresponding to sovereign credits, political influence, and crew. Each resource box tells players how much of that resource to start the game with, which players will collect now, and their racketeering income which indicates how much of that resource players will collect as part of the resource collection phase before taking into consideration resources from other bases and bonuses. You can ignore the racketeering income for now as this will only become relevant during the resource collection phase and we'll cover that in more depth later. Let's do a brief aside on resources. As alluded to a moment ago, there are three types of resources in Syndicate. Sovereign credits or credits, political influence or influence, and crew. Resources are stored in three denominations. Silver cubes represent one unit of a resource. Gold cubes represent five units of resources. And crystals represent ten units of resources. Back to setup, let's say we're setting up the Ascenders, which have three starting credits, zero starting influence, and five starting crew. So we'll place three silver cubes in the credit box, nothing in the influence box, and one gold cube in the crew box. Let's place a player marker in the first box of the tech level track. Different syndicates have different starting tech levels. In this case, the ascenders have a starting tech level of three. Over the course of the game, players can increase their tech level in a number of ways, and at certain tech levels, players unlock special abilities. Next, let's look at the assault track. Your assault level determines the maximum strength of your assault and other players' bases. As with tech levels, different syndicates have different starting assault levels, 
and throughout the game, players can increase their assault level. You can tell the starting assault level by the blue highlighted box on the assault track. In the case of the Ascenders, the starting assault level is 1. If this were Constellation Core, however, the starting assault level would be 2, and if this were the Fixers, the starting assault level would be 0. Since Ascenders starting assault level is 1, we'll place a player marker cube in the level 1 box, and a second player marker cube in the adjacent armed box. We'll cover assaults in more detail shortly. Next, place one action die in each of the two armed boxes under the action dice header. Action dice are used for completing missions and assaults. Whenever an action die is used, it's moved from the armed box to the used box. Each round, used action die are reset to armed during the resource collection phase. Finally, make sure to check whether your syndicate has a starting bonus, which you'll see in the top right of the map. In this case, the Ascenders have two bonuses. They start with a fortified base on Black Star, and also collect bonus resources during the resource collection phase for each exo base they control. We'll worry about the second bonus later, but we should set up the fortified base on Black Star now. Since we start with the fortified base on Black Star, we'll take the Black Star base card from the base card deck. We'll also remove the bonus tile on Black Star and put it back in the box with the other unused bonus tiles, and replace it with a base tile with the red fortified side up. Finally, we'll place one of our player marker cubes on the base tile to mark that it belongs to us. We'll talk about buying and fortifying bases in more detail later. Once every player has set up their respective player mats, roll the 12-sided Sovereign die to see who goes first. The player with the highest roll gets the player one hex, indicating they are the first player to act in the first round. With that, setup is complete and you're ready to get started. Although not necessary, we recommend nominating an archivalist who will act as a banker and oversee Sovereign cards and resource collection. You're set up and I know you're eager to play, but before diving into the details of all the game mechanics, let's quickly run through gameplay at a high level. Syndicate is played over 6-8 to eight rounds. The game ends the round after the beginning of the end card is drawn from the Sovereign deck. As you recall from setup, the beginning of the end card is shuffled into the Sovereign deck somewhere in the 5th, 6th, or 7th position, so you won't know exactly when the game will end. The player with the highest Syndicate score at the end of the last round wins. A player's Syndicate score is the sum of their Sovereign credits, which will constitute the majority of the Syndicate score, and their Victory Points, which players win as awards for reaching certain milestones. Victory Points are fairly straightforward, so we won't go into too much detail. In short, there are five awards laid out in the bottom right of the game board. Each award tells you how to win it, and how many Victory Points you get if you do win it. If you win an award, place one of your player cubes in that corresponding box. Only one player can claim each award, and if there's a tie, neither player gets to claim it. So what about Sovereign Credits? There are two main paths to wealth creation in the Arcturian Underbelly. You can complete all sorts of nefarious schemes, aka missions, or you can own income-generating criminal bases, which you can either purchase, trade for, or seize through violent means from other players. While missions and bases are the core of wealth creation, there are a number of other actions players can do on their turn to enhance their strategies. We'll cover these in more detail in subsequent videos. Each of the six to eight rounds has three phases, the player turn phase, the sovereign card phase, and the resource collection phase. Let's start with the player turn phase. During the player turn phase, starting with whoever has the player one marker, players one at a time take any number of actions they'd like until they decide to pass their turn to the next player clockwise. When it's your turn, there are eight possible actions you can take, which you can do in any combination. Two of the actions, missions and assaults, require rolling an action die. And since players have two action die per round, you can only attempt two of either missions or assaults or one of each in a round. Otherwise, there are no per se limits on the number of actions you can take. It's important to note that on your turn is the only time you can manage resources via exchange rates or by discarding unwanted operation cards. So if you expect to need resources later in the round, you'll need to plan ahead on your turn. The one action you cannot take on your turn is trading with other players. In fact, players can only trade or negotiate alliances when it's not their turn. Once you've taken all the actions you want to take, announce the end of your turn, and the player clockwise to you will begin their turn. We'll cover all the actions in more depth in subsequent videos. The player turn phase continues until all players have acted and the last player ends their turn. Then the round moves into the Sovereign card phase. Draw the top Sovereign card and read it to all players. Sovereign cards are for the most part punishments that have a dynamic severity linked to the alert level. 
After the Sovereign card is drawn, players have an option to bribe themselves out of the punishment by paying political capital or by playing the pardon card. Players that do not have the means or desire to bribe themselves out of the punishment, one at a time beginning with player one and moving clockwise, resolve the Sovereign card based on the card's instructions. Once the Sovereign card is resolved, you can discard it and move into the third and final phase of the round, the resource collection phase. This phase is also covered in more depth in a later video, but at a high level, as the name suggests, this is the phase where you collect resources based on your Sovereign's racketeering income as well as from bases you own and other related bonuses. During this phase, you'll also reset used action die and assault reinforcements, market a tech or military research, clear cubes from the market, and draw new operation cards. When everyone has collected their resources and reset, you'll pass the player one marker clockwise and start the next round, beginning with the player turn phase. Well, that's gameplay in a nutshell. If this section moved too quickly, don't worry. We'll cover the more confusing bits in more detail in upcoming videos. This section of the tutorial provides a deep dive into bases, the other key source of resources. You can acquire bases in a few ways. On your turn, you can pay for a base, assuming that territory is unoccupied. Or, if another player has the base you want, you can attempt to steal it from them via an assault. Also, when it's not your turn, you can trade for bases, as with anything else. To buy a base on an unoccupied territory, it's as simple as determining the cost, which will be printed on the base card, taking the bonus tile from the territory, if there's still one there, placing a base tile with the unfortified side up, and placing your player marker cube on top to indicate it belongs to you. If you so choose, you can pay an incremental cost, which is also stated on the base card, to fortify your base. You can also fortify through certain advanced tech bonuses and bonus chips. The advantage of fortifying your base is that it makes it more difficult for players to steal it from you in an assault, which we'll cover in more detail in the assault section, and it also makes it more difficult for the Sovereign to seize it from you in a crackdown, which we'll cover in more detail in the Sovereign card section. Finally, as you recall from the mission card section, fortifications will reduce rewards from robbery missions against you. You do not need an action die to buy or fortify a base. When you own a base, you'll collect resource income, as specified on the base card, each round during the resource collection phase. Note that bases in the middle and inner zones have negative crew income, which means to keep these bases up and running, you'll have to pay in crew each round. If you can't afford the crew cost, you'll flip over that base card and you won't collect other resources or bonuses from it. Also note, since you can only exchange resources on your turn, you'll need to plan ahead to make sure you have enough crew during the resource collection phase to pay your crew cost. The cost and income per round are the same for all bases in a given zone, and these values are posted on the player cheat sheets for quick reference, so you don't need to shuffle through all the base cards before making a purchasing decision. Some bases will grant the owner special bonuses so long as they own them. Mining centers, which are identifiable by the pickaxe symbol, grant players extra wildcard resources during the resource collection phase. Research stations, which are identifiable by the microscope symbol, provide tech research, and owning these bases is one of the few ways you can increase your tech level throughout the game. Each round you own a research station, you'll add a player marker cube in one of the designated research spots. When all the research spots are filled, on your next turn, you'll be able to clear the research and increase your tech level. The research process then repeats so long as you own the base. Military installations, which are identifiable by the chevron symbol, have a couple bonuses. These bases generate military research, much like research stations, except when you fill up the military installation research, you'll increase your assault level instead of your tech level. Military installations also provide temporary fortification benefits to adjacent bases connected by the red beam. Say for instance you own both Cedo and Etna, you'll be able to place a player marker cube in the designated protectorate box. Now, Etna is effectively fortified against player attacks, so long as you still own Cedo. However, don't flip the Aetna base tile to the fortified side, because this fortification bonus is only temporary. Note that tech and military research does not transfer in the event a base trades hands in an assault. Finally, there is one casino moon, Honos. Owning a base here grants you extra luck in a mission roll. Anytime you roll for missions while you own the base on Honos, you can add plus one to your roll, effectively increasing your odds of success on all missions. This section of the tutorial provides a deep dive into assaults, which allow you to attempt to steal someone else's base. Assaults are risky ventures, and the probability of success is a function of your assault level 
and whether or not the target base is fortified. To attempt the most basic assault, you'll need an armed action die and five crew. Simply announce the assault, place the assault ship on the board near the target, place the five crew into the corresponding box, and roll your action die. Without any reinforcements, you'll need to roll a six to win against an unfortified base. Fortifications increase the roll requirement by one, so in fact assaults with no reinforcements are not possible against fortified bases. To increase your odds of success, you can deploy reinforcements. The number of available reinforcements per round is equal to your assault level. So if your assault level is two, you'll have two reinforcements, each of which can be used once per round and will reset during the resource collection phase. Each reinforcement used during an assault lowers the roll requirement by one. To use your reinforcements, you'll need to expend five more crew on the assault for any number of reinforcements used. In other words, that additional five crew stays constant whether you're using one reinforcement or four. Say we're continuing this assault on Kafka and we have an assault level of two and we're gonna use both reinforcements now. So we'll place the five additional crew in the corresponding box on the assault ship and take our two available reinforcements from our player mat and place them on the corresponding reinforcement boxes also on the assault ship. Since we have two reinforcements against an unfortified base, we now need to roll only a four or higher. If you win, replace your opponent's player marker cube with your own and take the corresponding base card. This base now belongs to you. Discard all crew used in the assault, whether or not you were victorious, and take your reinforcement cubes and place them back on your player mat, but this time in the use box. These reinforcements cannot be used again this round, but will be reset during the resource collection phase. Finally, increase the alert level by one for any assault, whether victorious or not. This section of the tutorial provides a deep dive into mission cards, one of the key ways for players to generate resources throughout the game. Mission cards are one of two types of cards in the Operation card deck. Sleepers are the other type, but we'll cover those in another video. As a reminder, players start the game with four Operation cards, and each round during the resource collection phase, players will draw at least two new Operation cards, and sometimes more depending on whether or not they've used all their action dice. Each mission will tell you where the mission is located, in this case, we're looking at a mission on Goshen. Whether there's a round requirement to attempt a mission, in this case, we'd have to be in the second round or later to attempt this mission. Details of the actual crime or scheme being attempted, and the reward for completing the mission. In this case, successfully completing this mission will reward you seven credits, four influence, and six crew, which you'll collect from the bank. To attempt a mission, players roll one of their unused action die. The right side of the mission card will tell you what you need to roll to successfully complete the mission. The winning roll requirements differ from mission to mission and are all affected by whether there are criminal bases already set up in that territory. If there are no bases where the mission takes place, you'll refer to the top row of the roll requirements. If you are attempting this mission on Goshen and there are no bases in place there, you would need to roll a four, five, or six to be successful. Anything else would result in a failed mission. Before attempting this mission, you have the option to pay to hire extra hands, which results in a higher chance of success. In this case, if you paid one credit, two influence, and two crew, a roll of three or higher would result in a successful mission. This is of course a gamble, since you don't get those resources back if you fail. Now let's say you have a base on Goshen. Since you've already got a network in place, your odds of success go up, and a roll of three or higher will win this mission for you. You can of course still hire extra hands and improve your odds even more. Things get interesting if there's another criminal boss entrenched in that territory. When attempting a mission where someone else has a base, you have the option to cut that syndicate in on the spoils by giving them half the reward, or you can attempt the mission under their nose without their support, in which case the odds of success go down, but if you're successful, you keep the entire reward. This choice is entirely up to the person attempting the mission and does not require an explicit agreement from the other player controlling the base. There is another type of mission called a player versus player robbery. Unlike a regular mission, in which the reward comes from the bank, in robbery missions, the reward comes straight from another player's bank account. Robbery missions are specific to zones rather than to planets, and for you to attempt a robbery mission, the target needs to have a base in that zone. And in fact, you'll need to explicitly announce which base you're robbing before rolling your action die. As with a regular mission, when you attempt a robbery mission, you'll first roll an action die to see if you're successful, based on the specified roll requirements, which can also be improved by hiring extra hands. If your mission roll is successful, you'll roll a specified number of consequence dice to see how many credits you steal from your opponent. The number of dice you roll is affected by whether or not the target's base is fortified. This is another reason to fortify bases, which we'll talk about in more detail in the base section. As a reminder, completing missions does not result in ownership of the base. 
If you fail the mission, increase the alert level. If the alert level is already maxed out, place a Sovereign Destroyer on the territory where the mission was attempted. We'll talk more about the Sovereign Destroyer in more detail later. Whatever the outcome, discard the card and place the action die you used back on your mat, but now in the used box. Let's quickly chat about sleeper cards. Sleeper cards, which are part of the Operation card deck, are effectively traps that you can activate on your turn and spring at any other point in the game. To activate a sleeper card on your turn, simply place a sleeper card face down in the sleeper card placeholder on your player mat. Activating a sleeper card does not require an action die, but you can only have one sleeper card active at a time. So if you have another sleeper card already in your sleeper card placeholder, you need to either play it or burn it before you can play a different sleeper card. Once a sleeper card is activated, you can play it at any time appropriate for that sleeper. Say for instance, we've activated an It's Trap card. Later, when some poor fool tries to assault us, we can reveal our sleeper card and cause them to lose all assaulting crew. Once a sleeper card has been played, burn it in the Operation Discard pile. Now let's talk about the other actions a player can take on their turn, which we would describe as support functions that support your primary strategy. Say you're in a hurry to increase either your tech level or your assault level, and you don't have time to complete base-related research. You can purchase a skill increase in the market. There are separate markets for assault and tech level increases, and separate tracks for each player corresponding to their color. The cost of purchases, which is always in sovereign credits, increases as you make more purchases in a round. Say the red player wants to purchase a tech increase. Their first purchase will cost five sovereign credits, and they'll mark the purchase by placing their player cube in the corresponding box. Next, the red player wants to purchase an assault level. This will cost them six sovereign credits, and once again, they'll mark the corresponding box. Finally, the red player wants to purchase another assault level increase. Since the first box in the red player's assault level market is filled, the next Assault level purchase will cost 12 Sovereign Credits. During the resource collection phase, players can remove one cube from either market. In this case, the red player is removing their cube from the tech level market. On their subsequent turn, a tech level purchase will cost the red player 5 credits, and a Assault level market purchase will cost 18 credits. During their turns, players may also exchange resources for one another on their player mats. The exchange rate is set out on the player mats as follows. Two Sovereign Credits may be exchanged for one influence or one crew. Three crew may be exchanged for one influence, and three influence may be exchanged for one crew. Players have operation cards they don't want to play. They may burn them for one resource of their choosing. Players collect bonus chips when they're the first player to set up a base on a new territory. Some of these bonus chips provide temporary bonuses, while others permanently improve players' abilities after they're played. These bonus chips may be played at any time on that player's turn, and may be held to be played on a future turn. After a bonus chip is played, discard them back to the box. After all players have taken their turn, the first player will draw the top card in the Sovereign card deck and read the card aloud to all players. One at a time, beginning with player one, players resolve the Sovereign card. Players can choose to pardon themselves from the effects of the Sovereign card by either playing a pardoned sleeper card or by paying a bribe in influence. The cost of the bribe starts at three influence for players with no bases and increases for each base owned. Refer your player cheat sheet for a detail of the cost of a pardon at all levels of bases owned. Note, pardons are all or nothing. You cannot partially pardon yourself on some bases and not others. There are two sovereign cards that warrant a little more discussion. First, the tax card. If you can't afford the tax cost on one or more of your bases, you'll need to flip over those base cards for the resource collection phase. Keep this base card flipped for the duration of the next player turn phase, and you'll only flip it right side up at the start of the following sovereign card phase. During this resource collection phase, you'll collect no income from the base or from related bonuses, nor will you add research markers. And during the subsequent player turn phase, all bonuses are lost. For instance, military bases no longer provide fortification benefits. You still own this base, and it will return to normal at the start of the subsequent sovereign card phase, at which time you'll flip it right side up. Let's also talk about crackdowns. During a crackdown, players will select one safe zone base. If players only have one base or fewer, they do not need a roll for a crackdown. For everyone else, one at a time, players will announce which base they're rolling for and roll a 12-sided die. If the roll is less than the current alert level, 
and if that base is unfortified, it is lost, so remove the base tile and the player cube. If the roll is greater than or equal to the current level, that base is safe. If you fail a crackdown roll on a fortified base, first flip the base to the unfortified side and roll again. Repeat this process until players have rolled for all their bases other than their respective safe zone bases. The last phase of each round is the resource collection phase. First, players will collect two new operation cards. If any players have unused action dice, they will collect one extra operation card for each unused action die. So players will collect between two and four new operation cards each round. Next, reset all used action dice and reinforcement markers to armed. Now, players will collect resources, which will come from three sources. Racketeering income, which is a player's minimum level of income and stays constant throughout the game. Each player's racketeering income is different and set out on their resource collection boxes on their player mat. Second, players will collect income from bases. The income for each base is set out on that base card. Note that bases in the middle and inner zones have negative crew income, which means that you'll need to pay crew to maintain this base. If you do not have enough crew to cover the cost for a base, you'll need to flip that base card over for the remainder of the resource collection phase and subsequent player turn phase. Do not collect resources or place research. All bonuses related to that base are temporarily lost. At the start of the subsequent sovereign card phase, that base returns to normal, so flip it right side up. Also note, players cannot trade or exchange resources during the resource collection phase, so you'll need to plan ahead to make sure you have enough crew to maintain your bases. Third, players will collect income from bonuses such as mining planets or from trade routes, or from certain syndicate bonuses. Note that if a base card is flipped, you do not collect bonuses related to that card. For instance, if one planet out of a trade route is flipped, you no longer collect the trade route bonus. Once players have collected income, then add player cubes to the research planets. Once again, if a research planet base card is flipped, do not place a research cube that round. Next, if players have any cubes in the assault or tech level markets, remove one cube from either market. Finally, increase the round level and pass the first player marker clockwise to start the next player turn phase. Now you have a handle on the basics, so let's talk about a few advanced topics. Advanced tech cards are skills players can unlock by increasing their tech levels. At tech level 8, players can choose one class 1 advanced tech card, and at tech level 10, players can select either a second class 1 advanced tech card or a class 2 advanced tech card. The skills awarded by advanced tech cards are permanent and are only lost if advanced tech cards are traded to another player. Players may trade with one another throughout the game during the player turn phase, when it's not their turns. So for instance, if it is the red player's turn, the blue, green, and yellow players may trade with one another. But as soon as the red player passes their turn, blue may no longer participate in trading until after their turn. Anything can be traded, including bases, mission cards, bonuses, and even future alliances. However, everyone is a criminal, so there's no central enforcement of future agreements. Approach alliances with caution. After the alert level is maxed out, the Sovereign Blockade, which has sat on the sidelines up until this point, comes into play. Anytime a mission is failed with the maxed alert level, the blockade is moved to the base corresponding to where the mission was failed. The base with the Sovereign Blockade will no longer provide bonuses, including military protection bonuses or casino bonuses. Further, if the blockade is present during the resource collection phase, that base will not generate resources. The blockade can be moved off the board by a player on their turn during the player turn phase, or by any player during the Sovereign card phase by paying 10 influence. The blockade can also be moved off by failing a mission on a different territory. After the beginning of the end card comes out, the game ends after the following round. So the final sequence is beginning of the end card, resource collection phase, the last player turn phase, the last sovereign card, and one final resource collection. After final resources are collected, the winner is the player with the highest syndicate score, which is the sum of their sovereign credits plus victory points from awards. In the event of a tie, influence and then crew are used as a tiebreaker.